hugging or close greeting. Uh, but washing of your hands is really important because we touch our faces so often. People don't realize how much they touch their nose, they touch their mouth, uh, touch their eyes without noticing. So if you're touching your uh, mouth, your eyes, your uh, nose with uh, contaminated fingers, then that's way that you're infecting yourself from something, some surface or object that you had touched that's contaminated. Now that contamination is in your respiratory system through your mouth, through your nose. Now, for example, dear teachers, if you put this mask on your face, how, how this mask protect you from the introduction of the virus in your system? To the nose? So it depends on uh, what, kind, yeah, what kind of mask you're wearing. So if you're wearing a normal medical surgical mask, uh, it covers both your nose and mouth if you're wearing it correctly. It sits very tightly on your face so there's no pockets where the virus could like jump through. Uh, so it's actually waterproof on the outside and prevents you know, any wet big droplets of virus coming through from someone who is coughing on you or sneezing on you. And at the same time, if you are coughing or sneezing, the inside is absorbent. So it absorbs all the fluid and droplets that you are coughing and that you are sneezing out. So it works in two ways. It protects others from your cough and sneeze, and it protects you from the cough and sneeze of other people. But what it cannot do is protect you from the virus that's on surfaces like doorknobs or uh, desk, desktops and other objects that may have been touched or coughed on by a, by a symptomatic person. No. My question is, we're protecting the nose and the mouth. What about the eyes? So for most uh, people who are not in very close contact with people, their eyes probably uh, wouldn't be at high risk. But if you're a medical professional who's doing certain procedures that spray a lot of droplets into the air, then you definitely need to be wearing eye protection. So if you see doctors in the wards, uh, they are wearing masks and they're wearing eye protection as well when they're doing certain high-risk procedures, like doing swabs to test for coronavirus. Uh, those type of procedures, you definitely need to be wearing eye protection. In a community setting, when you're walking past somebody, I don't think you need to be wearing uh, eye protection for that. Yes. So let's talk about the duration of the virus on the surfaces. Uh, we have a different variables of surface, so as doorknob, cardboard, uh, car door, or you name it. Uh, how long can this virus still survive officially outside a, a reservoir? Yeah, so a virus needs a reservoir to live. So if you leave it out on any surface uh, within a few days, it will definitely die. But it does try and grow on certain types of surfaces. So it really likes uh, steel, uh, metal, so things like doorknobs, uh, you know, stainless steel. It really likes uh, plastic uh, type of surfaces, but it doesn't do so well on cardboard uh, and it doesn't do so well out in nature, like on trees and plants. What about clothes, human clothes? Cloth, it is about the same as cardboard, so not as well as it sticks to metal and plastic, but probably as well as it sticks to cardboard. So metal and plastic are the, are the conductors? Not so much conductors, but it can just live longer. It's not significantly longer. So let's say if it, if it can live an hour or two on cardboard, it can live up to 48 hours on steel. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, does this mean um, wearing gloves also is a good uh, protection for pumping a gas at the gas stations or opening a door? You have to be careful because if you're wearing a medical gloves, they're supposed to be used in a very specific way, meaning that you use them to do one specific activity and after you've done that activity, you dispose of that glove. And if you need to do another activity, you put on another pair of gloves. 
So the mistake I've seen people make is wearing one pair of gloves the whole day. So they're touching the gas pump with what a pair of gloves. Then they get in their car and touch their steering wheel with those same gloves. Then they get home and touch their doorknob with those same gloves. And then they go and uh, put, hang their coat in the, the drawer with that same uh, glove on their hands. So you can imagine if the gas pump is contaminated, all your gloves have done is just transport those germs to your car and to, into your home. So if you're not using gloves correctly, uh, then it's much better to just not wear gloves and just wash your hands as regularly as you can. Okay. Um, as we speak, is any cure of vaccine because people in uh, Marseille, doctor in Marseille, French doctor, he's uh, bragging that he has cured some people with the nivacaine and chloroquine. Um, there are a lot of uh, drugs that there are anecdotes or stories about. So in medicine, we don't change our practice based on stories people tell. So from your clinical practice, you may have had an experience of one or two patients uh, where you, you, can, you think the reason they got better was the drug. But in medicine, we only uh, use uh, scientific evidence to make those uh, determinations. So just a few stories from people does not make a scientific recommendation. So what we're doing now in many cases is doing what we call randomized controlled trials. These are experiments where you're comparing the drug you think does something to something else. You compare it head to head. When you don't have a comparison group, uh, then you can't really be sure that the change you're seeing is because of this drug and not some other factor about that patient uh, that may have made them recover. By having a comparison group, you're able to uh, adjust for what we call the confounding, other reasons that could explain why the person got better. So we don't accept uh, evidence just based on stories. This is not how medical science works. We wait for the results of a randomized control trial, uh, which tells us that, you know, on average, this drug you know, provides a benefit compared to doing X or doing Y or doing Z. So this is the only way we can change clinical practice. Okay. Okay. So we um, we're getting close to our first part of this interview. We're gonna take um, we're gonna take a small break and then uh, we're gonna um, we're gonna attack the second part. But before we go into that second part, let me ask you a question regarding. Um, a blood plasma from um, a somebody who already contacted and and got well from COVID virus, and if they say they, they can use that also as a cure, is that is that a correct? Uh, so this method was used has been used in other diseases before, like during SARS, we used the plasma of recovered patients to treat those who had SARS. Uh, I think in Ebola as well, they've tried this. So it's, a, it's a, a proven way of doing it in past diseases. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of clinical trials happening right now, including for this uh, plasma use as well. Uh, and, it's, like I, and you have to make sure that the plasma is correct, that collected in the correct way, it's tested for other infections so you don't infect people getting that plasma. You have to do everything in an orderly way. But there's a, a lot of hope that the plasma from recovered patients will be able to give antibodies to people who are struggling and trying to fight off this virus. All right. Thank you. Uh, Radio Seku, as you listen, uh, listener, we are listening to Dr. Nikki, who is a health, uh, health uh, person in charge of COVID-19 virus in Singapore. Uh, we're going to take a small break now, and then we're going to come back to the second part. We're going to ask Dr. Nikki, more question, what to do, what not to do, and uh, uh, to prevent these virus from getting close to people. 